Hello, everyone. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the Tourette Association of America's virtual conference. My name is Natalie Joseph Pauline Blaine, and I am the Education Project Manager at the Tourette Association of America. Thank you so much for joining us today for the diverse experience of living with Tourette syndrome presentation. We want to thank our platinum sponsors, the Warner Fund, Pharma, as well as all our donors and supporters for making this free conference possible. To support educational programming like this, you may visit Tourette.org slash donate to make a contribution today. During the session, we would be very happy to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. You may ask questions or share comments using the question panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar pl player at any time. We will collect your questions and address them during the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. It really is my pleasure to introduce our moderator and our panelists for this session. Um, our moderator is Dr. Emily Ricketts, and then we will hear from our wonderful panelists who will introduce themselves in a bit. Chloe Winston, Yvette Diagria, Michael Chichiocho, and Brian Lane. So without further ado, I'd like to thank you again so much for being here, and we'd like to start with our presentation. All right, thank you, Natalie. Okay, well, thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining, and to our panelists. Um, we are delighted to to be doing this. It, you know, it has been a long time coming um, due to uh, you know the the pandemic and uh, and last year's um, conference. So we've had some delays, but we're happy that we're able to do this. Um, so you know, first. I'd like to say that you know we know that anyone can have Tourette syndrome. So Tourette Tourette syndrome affects all races, ethnicities, genders, and ages. Um, you know we also know that it is a lifelong condition, um, and you know although it does fluctuate in terms of you know severity over time, um, and may decrease uh, you know during adolescence for some. Uh, generally, you know, it does tend to be uh, chronic. And, you know, during our panel, we would like to highlight uh, the concept of intersectionality. So, you know, this refers to how various aspects of a person's um, social identities uh, unite to influence discrimination and privilege. Um, and, you know, this is, you know, relevant to Tourette syndrome as it can certainly intersect with other factors, including race, ethnicity, um, class, religion, gender, um, sexuality, and more. And, you know, this has implications as uh, individuals with Tourette syndrome and other social identities um, may, you know, come across additional challenges um, you know, including discrimination, stigma, um, you know, added mental health burden, and, you know, this all uh, can, you know, adversely impact health um, and quality of life. So now I would like to uh, introduce uh, our panelists um, in alphabetical order. So uh, we have uh, Michael Chichiocho, we have Yvette de Aguiar, Brian Lane, and Chloe Winston. And so now um, we will have uh, each of them just, uh, you know, introduce themselves, talk about their role with the Tourette Association of America, where they're from, and just anything interesting they would like to share about themselves. So we will start with um, Michael. Hi, everyone. Um... Like she said, my name is Michael uh, Chichioko. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, 23 years old. And I started. I joined the TAA in 2014, where I was trained as a youth ambassador, and I really just fall in love with public speaking and spreading Tourette's awareness ever since. And then also in uh, 2019, I was trained as a rising leader and uh, really involved with the TAA. And I think just as much as I was been able to do a lot of speaking with them, I think they really helped me. Um, with my self-confidence and acceptance of Tourette's. Um, and yeah, I just graduated from college. I just graduated from Northeastern in December, and then I'm applying for medical school at the moment in Boston. Excellent. 
All right, and now we'll hear from Yvette. Hi, my name's Yvette Diagier, like I mentioned. I'm 23 years old as well, and I was also trained as a rising leader in 2019, so I've been involved with that. Um, I went to the University of Florida for my undergraduate degrees. I got two of them, and I did a lot of presentations there as well about Trick Syndrome to help spread awareness as well as I shadowed at the Motor Disorders Clinic at UF and worked with Dr. Heather Simpson, who's an occupational therapist that administers CBIT to other patients that have Tourette syndrome. So that was really interesting. And basically the what I hope to bring to this panel is the Hispanic experience of having Tourette syndrome. I'm Cuban American from Miami, Florida. And there's a lot of stigma and lack of education about neurological disorders like Tourette syndrome in the Hispanic community that I've in my experience and mental health as well and a lot of my journey has been working with education to become the best advocate that I could be for myself and others and educating others in my community so I hope that by sharing my experiences I can help other people out there who are in similar situations. Wonderful um, and now we'll hear from Brian. Hi, I'm Brian Lane, and I am about the same age as everybody on the panel combined. Uh, just kidding. I am. Uh, I've been around the Tourette Association since 1988. That was a long time ago, back when the conferences weren't like they are today. That's for sure. Um, <clears throat> I was diagnosed when I was seven years old. I'm currently 50 years old, so I am the old guy here. Uh, I have uh, been a school teacher and a school administrator over the last 27 years, and. <clears throat> done all kinds of things. I'm also a volunteer firefighter and EMT, former part-time policeman. So I, I'm just here to, to show you that everything you can, you can, you want to achieve, you can achieve through, even though you may have uh, some Tourette or, or any other issues that go along with that. Um, and then I'm also a member of the LGBTQ community as well. So I am here to, to let you know that we exist and we're okay, even though we, uh, we kind of get looked at weird every once in a while, you know, we're just like everybody else and uh, we persevere and do the best we can. Thank you, Brian. You've had a lot of diverse uh, working experiences. That's great. <laughs> You've done it all. Um, and uh, now we'll hear from Chloe. Hi, my name is Chloe Winston. I'm 19 years old and I'm from Leesburg, Virginia and I'm a senior in high school. And I was trained as a youth ambassador in 2019 with the Tourette Association of America. And my goal of being on this panel is to bring my perspective as someone who is black and also part of the LGBT community and how those identities affect to my Tourette syndrome and how people perceive me. Great, all right, well, um... Uh, what we'll be doing is, um, you know, so we'll be leading uh, our panelists through, um, you know, just some questions about their, you know, their diverse experiences. Um, and let me just stop, stop my screen for a second. And yeah, we'll get started. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, you know, we think about as, you know, as clinicians and, and researchers sometimes is just, um, you know where where there may be delays in 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 diagnosis or recognition of you know of ticks um, when they begin. Um, so I guess our first question is really you know what what did your family or community think ticks were when they first began? Um, and so we will start with uh, Michael. Yeah, so I think um, to preface, I think the best way for me to answer this is just tell a little bit about my family. So I'm Philip, I'm Filipino, Filipino American, and my family, uh, majority of my family is still in the Philippines, but a lot of um, all of them, like my parents, they grew up in the Philippines and they came, um, you know, for college and like in their twenties. And I think that you know, being raised in that environment, I had one sister, but I was the eldest. Um, being raised in a Filipino household, I think really shaped the way. Um, that they responded to my text when they came up to answer the question. And, you know, in the Philippines, um, you know, nobody really knew what Tourette syndrome was, uh, mental health, neurological disorders, a lot of that stuff, especially when my parents were being raised, that wasn't really talked about. Um, and it just, there just was no exposure to that. So when my 
when I first started taking, the first ticks I had, it was a lot of um, eye rolling ticks, blinking ticks, and I had like this throat clearing sound that I'd always like make. And a lot of it was they just thought I was doing it on purpose. Um, I was a pretty hyperactive kid, so they thought it was just me like misbehaving. You know, uh, certain family members thought I was like faking it to get attention or um, just just to be rude, quite frankly. Um, and that was kind of the story that my take started around when I was five. And that was kind of just the story for the next few years. And I think around, when I was like 10, something like that is when we went to like a doctor, just like a primary care doctor. She told me it was like allergies, a lot of people still not really being able to pinpoint it. And again, since culturally we haven't really been um, exposed to this, they didn't even consider the fact that it could be a neurological disorder since, until I was like 14. Um, so that's something I talk about a lot because, you know, I was five when my symptoms first started and it wasn't even diagnosed until I was 14. So that's a very nine years gap um, without a diagnosis and without treatment or anything like that. And I do think that culture and being Filipino and that environment and what my parents were, you know, not exposed to, I think that played a big role um, in my upbringing. Yeah, so there, so there was quite a, a long, a long gap between between when it began and when you you got that diagnosis. And when did it? When did they realize that perhaps it was, you know, more than what they thought initially? Yeah, I think it was for me. It was when, in my case, it was when my tics got more severe. Um, so right around eighth grade, you know, that's when it started to. I was repeating words. I was yelling out words. I was. Um, I had like a slapping tick. And I was like jumping up and down, clapping my hands. And that was when I was like, okay, this is not just seasonal allergies like that doctor told me. Like it's definitely more than that. But sometimes I always ask myself like, you know, what if my tics just stayed how they were? What if they just stayed at like, you know, facial twitches and rolling my eyes and throat clearing sounds and they never got to that point? I wonder like if I would have been diagnosed later, if I ever would have been diagnosed. Um, it's something interesting. I just play around within my head. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, thank you for sharing. And um and how, you know, to our other panelists, um, have you had similar experiences? What was your experience like? Mine was a lot different. Uh so again, I oh sorry. Go ahead, Chloe, if you want to go ahead, that's fine. Or whoever that was. So I had a similar experience growing up. The ticks I had were seen as allergies so everyone, was, everyone just thought you know I had allergies or people saw it as a behavior because a lot of other black people I've encountered know nothing about Tourette's like there's no education there's no knowledge it's just not known about so either it was thought to be a behavior or allergies or that I was seeking attention and when I was 16 they got a lot worse and um, I started I developed coprolalia and just my tics kind of were very exacerbated and at that point it was it was even more difficult because people around me thought it was just extra behavior like oh you want attention that's why you're starting <laughs> and making all these noises because you just want attention but mm -hmm. my mom was always really supportive and she started taking me to different doctors and i was seeing a psychiatrist at the time for other issues who recognized they were ticks and then i officially saw a neurologist when i was 17 and then was diagnosed at that point um but growing up like I don't I don't know if they would have if my family had known if they it would have been caught earlier but it took them getting worse to get to the point where I could actually get diagnosed because they just didn't know what it was like even with the stereotypes they didn't it wasn't I didn't present that way for a long time so it wasn't even thought that it could be that mm, I see yeah and and how old were you when when you first noticed tips like looking back I would say probably around five. Um, definitely looking back and remembering, I didn't even think they were ticks. I just thought they were weird little things I had to do. Like that didn't even cross my mind that they could be ticks. Like if you told me they were ticks back then, I would have been like, I never, I've never been bit by a tick. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. So to me, they were just like little things I had to do. And most of the time they didn't super bother me, but sometimes they're like, why do I have to blink so much? Why do I have to sniffle? Like it was just, I kind of got used to it and it wasn't until it got worse that it really threw me for a loop. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you you know you bring up a good point. So you're saying you know even the the stereotypes of what Tourette might be you know wouldn't have clued um, somebody in you know if your family in because you weren't exhibiting that those kinds of symptoms. So um, okay, and uh, and Brian. Yeah, so mine's a lot different because I, I'm again I grew up in the 70s as opposed to uh, the current time. And back then, nobody knew anything about Tourette. There was nothing, you know, nothing was known. I, very, very few were diagnosed. Um, I was one of very, I think I was, I want to say I was the first one officially diagnosed through the doctor's office I was in. And <clears throat> I was diagnosed when I was seven, started ticking when I was about three. Um, grew up in a very bad home, totally different situation, not not for this conference, but or for this meeting. But um, I I always knew it was weird. I knew I had to do it. I was always punished for doing it um, at home and at school. Um, I happened to go to the doctor for a different reason. And um, it was a doctor who was just fresh out of medical school that I had visited. And he had he recognized it and sent me to a neurologist. And uh, that's how it was diagnosed. Um, like most people, I was told, especially back then, that it, you know when you became an adult, it would go away. You know, once you once you grew up, it would be gone. Um, I know that's even still told today, unfortunately, and that just blows my mind because this was what 45 years ago at this point, and hey, hey, it's obvious that doesn't always happen. Um, mm -hmm. It waxes and wanes just like the rest of you, but yeah, it's it was just a lot different story growing up. We we didn't have Brad Cohen, we didn't have the Tourette Association, you know, nobody knew anything about that. So, mm -hmm. it's a uh, it's great to have that. It was one of the greatest discoveries in my life. I remember crying when I found the Tourette Association. Of course, there was no internet either, no computers, nothing like that back then. I I used to dial the phone, by the way. So, anyway, <laughs> so that's it's it was hard, you know. You went to the library and did your research the best you could. So, yeah. yeah. And things have changed quite a bit. Um, and and how old were we you? We did have cars. We 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 were we were driving cars. So. <laughs> <laughs> and how how old were you when you you know that that doctor who was fresh out of medical school? Um, yeah, I was seven. It was it was I was seven years old. I I was taken in there for strep. Oh. <clears throat> and this oh. is not the weird thing is it's not it has nothing to do with the strep. You know I know that that kind of crosses over to another bridge. But mm -hmm. um, hey hey. He just noticed that I was blinking a lot and <clears throat> clearing my throat, which I still do, as you can hear. I mean, these these have stuck around for as long as I have. So, uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's that's how it was. <clears throat> okay, so you so you were seven, so it was a, a little bit younger. Okay, and then yeah, so that's when I was diagnosed, and I remember I remember having my family tell me it was you know at age three that they remember when I was ticking, and I I've, I've I have no memories when I wasn't. So, <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, and Yvette. So my story is also a little different. I was diagnosed very young. My parents started noticing that I was having tics. They didn't know it was tics, but they started noticing that I was blinking a lot and coughing a lot when I was very young, like maybe three years old. Mm -hmm. um, it was strange because they thought I was always sick or had allergies. So I went to a million allergists. I was always on cough medication and nothing was working and they were freaking out like, what What could this be? And my mom had told me, it was so funny. I think that my story would have been very similar to Chloe's and Michael's if my mom hadn't seen this before I was born. But they had an Oprah special on Tourette syndrome. Oh. And my mom when she saw that i kept on blinking and i kept on coughing she was like i think these are tics like i think my daughter has tourette syndrome and no one else in my family had ever heard of that so my grandparents were obviously freaking out they were like there's no way that she has this like no we don't know anybody who's had this and in cuba they didn't know anybody who's had tourette syndrome i'm sure people there do but it's just not diagnosed so hmm. it was Oh, there was a big push for me to get diagnosed by my grandparents basically because my mom knew that it was Tourette syndrome but she was like okay i'm gonna get it confirmed so i finally got diagnosed in kindergarten and there is another story with a neurologist that i'll bring up later in this presentation but it was a very i don't know like things just kind of clicked together 
it kind of was like, I don't know if it was like fate or what it is, but it just mm-hmm. kind of clicked together that they found out that I had Tourette so young. I feel like if my mom hadn't seen that Oprah Winfrey show with about Tourette syndrome, I wouldn't have been diagnosed until way later because my Tourette's were so mild when I first started having them and didn't get bad until elementary school. So yeah, that so was you- my experience. Yeah, so you, you know, it's so fortunate that she, you know, she did catch that show and, you know, it just, it just speaks to the importance of continued, you know, you know, programs to, to provide awareness, um, you know, just broadly to parents in general, so that they know it when they see it, which is, which we, yeah, you know, so helpful. So, um, okay. And, you know, we've, We've already touched on how, you know, some of your family uh, responded to ticks, um, you know, initially when they didn't know, you know, what they were, um, you know, so some people thought they were allergies or that, you know, you were being rude or it was hyperactivity, um, fidgetiness, things like that. Um, I guess how, you know, are there any, do you have any other insights regarding, you know, how family or friends have have reacted to your ticks, um, you know? I guess, knowing now what they, what they are. Yeah. So I feel like one really good thing was that my parents never saw it as a limitation. So they Mm -hmm. never were like, oh, you have Tourette syndrome, so you can't do this. or you can't do that. My family was always very supportive. And even my extended family who still doesn't fully understand about Tourette syndrome, even though like I try to educate them, they know I have it and they know that it's not a limitation. Like I can do whatever I want to do. And so can anyone else with Tourette syndrome. But at the same time, that was almost a hindrance to me because I feel like I wasn't provided the resources that I needed. Like, I feel like when I was younger, I would have benefited from seeing a doctor for my Tourette's, maybe getting on a medication that would have helped the severity. I feel like I would have benefited from being able to see a psychiatrist that would have helped with the mental health issues and depression and and anxiety I was dealing with. So I think what's so important and what we're doing in this talk today is like education about what resources are available for people with Tourette's syndrome and how they can be provided for so families know how to react when they see their kids tick and how to best support them. Yeah, you you know, you raise a great point, you know, so um, it's kind of that uh, balance between, you know, we want to have this, you know, we want to make sure that people have the same expectations of individuals with Tourette syndrome as others. Um, and at the same time, you know, we also want to, you know, provide, you know, make sure we're providing treatment, resources, accommodations when needed. Um, mm-hmm. And so it sounds like, you know, your parents and, and grandparents perhaps were just, you know, more focused on, you know, you can do, you know, you can do anything and everything and, and not, you know, not really thinking about um, additional, you know, areas where you could benefit from, you know, treatment. So, yeah, there just weren't the resources. I don't think that there was the same education back then. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, now they- now they realize, but um, back then they just weren't provided resources by the neurologist or by any other health professional. So they weren't pointed towards support groups or anything. Right. Yeah. So that it was kind of they they were not directed to those the available resources at the time. Yeah. And can I can I comment there real quick? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things I've noticed, Yvette, that has changed so much, especially, with, and I, Emily can echo this, just being a part of the Education Advisory Board and Diversity Committee, the Tourette Association has just exploded over the last 10 to 12 years in, in getting information and educating people, which is awesome. I mean, in, in the 30 years I've been a part of this organization, it's it's amazing how how far it's gone and how many resources there are available just in the last 10 years. And so I agree that that, that 100%. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I actually really, I wanted to just echo all the sentiments as well. Um, I think um, I think the biggest problem that I had, especially when I, even when I first joined the TA in 2014 and when I was first getting the diagnosis, a lot of family members and even friends, once they, you know, came to terms with accepting the diagnosis, there was like a, a little bit of a delay in that where they didn't accept that. But even after they accepted it, it's kind of this thing where they didn't know um, what to say. It's kind of like, yeah, we like support you, but we don't know what to say to you. And because we don't know how to help. And I think that came from what everyone's been mentioning about like a lack of resources. And I think now, you know, fast forward like seven years later, I think now it's like, I've, you know, 
you know, I've, I've met different families, like some families have reached out to me and saying like, oh, like my son was just diagnosed at this age. And now it's like, oh my God, like there's so many resources that I can point them to. And I think the TA, and that's something I, that I've noticed a big change the last seven years. Now I feel like I can just have all of these links that I can send them to, connect them to like a center of excellence if it's in their location. And I think I've been really, it's been so much easier to help families now learn more about this because there's just so much available online. Um, and I do think that makes a big difference because that does tackle that problem of, you know, family members or friends being like, oh, I don't know what to say. Now it's like, okay, here's a lot of things that you can say and they can talk about it in support groups with other people who are in a similar situation and figure out, you know, what works best for the situation. Yeah, so the, the Tourette Association has, you know, has really done an excellent job, um, you know, raising awareness and, and providing a bank of resources um, to people, so, and providers as well, because that's another, you know, the other side of things too. Um, yeah, and and Chloe, did you, um, you know, how, how have your, you know, family or friends responded to ticks? Initially, um, when I was younger, it was kind of the ignore strategy. So it was just kind of swept under the rug. No one really mentioned it, brought attention to it. Unless it was particularly bad, then you should be like, oh, Chloe, you know, you're kind of being annoying. Can you please stop? And I, I didn't know how to explain that I couldn't. So I would kind of just walk away from a situation or try my hardest to not do it, which doesn't work out for me personally very well. Um, but when it got worse, um, a lot of my friends were just, they were supportive, but they also didn't really know what to say. They just kind of took it in stride. And my family, my mom was always very supportive and so was my brother, but my grandmother had a really hard time understanding. <laughs> my, my grandmother had a really hard time understanding my tics. She always thought that it was things that I was thinking. And I was like the heart, even now, it's been almost three years since the increase in my takes, and she still has a very hard time understanding that, especially with coprolalia, that it's not my thoughts, that I'm not thinking these things, or I'm not wishing for these things to happen. <laughs> it's just a tick. And so that's been kind of a struggle between her and I, is just getting her to kind of understand that how it works and how she can support me. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, still trying to to have her understand that it's involuntary and it's not just, you know, you relaying, you know, your thoughts out loud. Um, yeah. And uh, I guess this, you know, this kind of blends with the, the next question, but um, how have you noticed or have you had particular experiences where people have found out that you have Tourette syndrome who maybe didn't know, um, and what was that like? For me, um, especially people who I, I didn't talk to, like maybe after middle school and I saw them again, they were always very surprised. They were like, mm -hmm. oh, I had no idea that you had tics at all because you didn't, you know, my tics weren't always the way they are now. So it was always just a shock to people. And even with extended family, I've had some issues there because a lot of times they're like, oh, it's just because you're a teenager and it's behavior. Like that's that's all it is. Like you're a teenager with behavior, acting out, you're just being a teenager. And I try to get them to understand it has nothing to do with behavior, it has nothing to do with being a teenager. It's just Tourette syndrome. Mm -hmm. And so it's typically, it's just kind of shock and then it's kind of acceptance because a lot of my tics can be kind of vulgar, which I don't swear outside of my tics. So that surprised a lot of people because before that point, they may have never heard me swear before, um, or it can be kind of loud. So it's usually just a lot of shock or sometimes just denial. And I don't know if that comes from being ashamed or where that comes from, but sometimes it's just, you know, denial that that's what it is. And it's just people, sometimes people want to think it's just a behavior and they can kind of train it out of me. Okay. So yeah, so people are were kind of shocked to, to find out and um, yeah. So it's, I guess, a contrast with how they had, you know, seen you before. Um, yeah, does, it, does anybody else have, uh, you know, experiences or, you know, times they can remember where somebody found out that they had Tourette syndrome and, and how they reacted? Well, the one I can use is the first time I 
I got discovered while I was teaching. Uh, mm -hmm. That certainly was an interesting <clears throat> day. Um, I, you know, after all these years, I've done pretty good at at masking them, and I can suppress them for a certain amount of time now. Um, you know, we all learn these these tricks of the trade, so to speak, and the 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 different tools we carry in our toolbox, but. You know, after that first time, I was scared to death, of course, very young teacher starting out thinking I was going to get fired, not have a job because of my disability. And uh, it, you know, it truly is not a disability. It is a it is an ability uh, in disguise that I can use to educate, you know, people about a topic they're not really aware of. And so now after that happened every year, I just bring it out and right at the beginning and we talk and we have, a, you know, we, it's just it's just a part of the class, just like everything else. <clears throat> And you know the, the greatest blessing was the first time I had a student in my room that had Tourette's. So that was a blessing and curse for him and me. But because um, <clears throat> we all know that we 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 catch each other's ticks, of course. And um, mm -hmm. but uh, it was great. He had he had no idea that he had Tourette, and that was you know I'm saying it's one of the greatest moments of my my teaching career. So being able to share that. So those are some you, of the, you know just a couple. Is it, you, did you say the student didn't know that they had Tourette? No idea. Yeah, he had no idea he had Tourette. Um, okay. And then uh, I actually ended up obviously developing a, a, a pretty good relationship with, with him as a student and then of course with his parents because he had a lot of questions and wanted to know what was going on. Um, I, I teach choir and theater, so it's a little bit different ballgame than English and math and, and history and social studies and stuff. But um, he ended up being one of my very best uh, actors and singers throughout the years and uh, I'm still in touch with him. So it's in he's in his late 30s now so um it's uh it's just it's it's great that you know we often look at this as, as a bad thing for us but um there are many wonderful things that happen <clears throat> because of Tourette syndrome too yeah and you you know you you raise a, a good point about um what would be called a preventative or preventive disclosure um you know so it you know which is just for the audience so where you reveal um you know, an aspect of your, I guess, you know, your condition or, you know, disorder, disability before, you know, before the person finds it out some other way. And this can, you know, reduce stigma. Um, and, you know, did you find, I guess, once you, you told your class, like, how did they react? Oh, well, it got to the point, it, it was, you know, tons of questions and, you know, uh, the first couple of weeks it was kind of awkward, but it just became, like I said, it just became a part of me and uh, you know i i'm not saying i'm the best teacher in the world but i you know one of the things i try to do is establish really strong relationships with my students so that they they feel safe and they feel comfortable and they know they can ask me just about anything um because i think that's important as we're growing up uh that, that students and young people get to ask questions how they learn that's how they become that's how they develop their own minds and their, and their social skills and you know lifelong learning is so important so uh it got to the point that we you know we had a while where it, they learned the words they learned the things to trigger me so if they really wanted to get me off on a tangent they knew exactly what to do so we, it, it was fun we had we had a lot of fun with it and you know when they realized they weren't gonna get in trouble for it you know it was just we had we would have a really good time and it actually made i think it actually made the class more relaxed eventually <clears throat> and much more fun because they felt comfortable around somebody that was quote unquote different mm -hmm. that's great and um, Yvette and Michael, have, do you have any experiences along along these lines with people finding out that you have Tourette syndrome and their response? Yeah. yeah. Are we? Do you want to go, Michael? Don't worry. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, it's really interesting, Emily, when you brought up the whole, you know, preventative like disclosure. Do you say it like front right away, like I have Tourette's, um, or do you hide it? And I think for me, I, it's something that I think I've had so m I'm, I'm always so conflicted about it. It'd be so interesting to see what everyone else has to say on this, because I think I've had uh, both positive and negatives, like for, you know, when someone finds out. So I think I remember one time, this was a few years ago, I was like, I was at a job, I was at a training that had just started mm -hmm. and I was very like, I was just, it, it was in a healthcare job. I was really like worried that maybe my tics would, you know, interfere and this and that. And I just wanted to talk to someone about it. So I remember I talked to like, a, like a vice president, a high up in the um, organization and looking, I was looking for like a comforting conversation, but that then turned, and that this was my first job ever, that then turned into her saying, 
she heard I had Tourette's. She said, oh, that's a red flag. I don't know if you can do this job. And then she reported it to my supervisor. And then to me, you know, I was a sophomore in college. It's like, oh gosh, I'm never doing that again. But, you know, mm -hmm. I think I did, you know, to then bring it more positively, like I, you know, about a year and a half after that, I worked at another job and I was working in the lab. And mm -hmm. uh, someone found out pretty quickly right away. They noticed it and they asked. So then I told them, like, honestly, within the first few days of me working there, and I just told them up front, I have threats, et cetera, et cetera. And they like really like, you know, kind of applauded me on it. You know, they're like, oh, to do, I was doing chemistry research. They were like, that's amazing that you're able to like, you know, still do all these things that are always so supportive. They always like um, said, Michael, if you need to like step out, step out, we'll finish whatever experiments you're doing. And yeah, I've definitely had, I mean, of course, so many more stories, but I've definitely had both experiences where someone finds out and you kind of get the whole negative or someone finds out and, and I'm actually glad that I told them. Um, so I think for me, I always go back and forth, you know, when I meet someone, is this the first thing I tell them or do I just wait and let them find out organically? And, you know, I, it's probably something where it's not black and white, like, you know, every situation is different and maybe sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but that's been my experience. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like you're, you're never, necessarily certain as to how you know how one might react if you if you tell them so um, it's not guaranteed that if you you know reveal that you have Tourette syndrome that they you know that the person will respond um, you know in a positive way so. and just as a teacher I've noticed that students are a lot better than adults when it comes to accepting and you know especially during the COVID time here you know I walk into a grocery store and I'm looked at like I was Satan you know so <clears throat> Yeah, that is a that is a big thing right now that you know people with Tourette syndrome are dealing with is just yeah you know obviously people are afraid of you know afraid of COVID and you know and they are they are not going to know that you know if coughing you know sneezing sniffling throat clearing they will not you know think it's a tick um, unless told otherwise that's for sure so I'd imagine that's been pretty difficult for people um, yeah. And uh, and Yvette. So same as Michael, I've had both like positive and negative experiences. Usually though, with people my own age, if I'm meeting them for the first time and they notice, I'll like let them know like, oh, by the way, I have Tourette syndrome. And I say it really casually. So I feel like usually the reactions are pretty good. I think a lot of the times you have to say it like it's no big deal. Because if you make a really big deal out of it, or you're like you're very nervous when you're telling them, they're they might be put off, and maybe that'll roll into like a negative experience. So like I found, because when I was younger, I was very nervous to tell people. I always lied. Like they'd be like, "Oh, why are you blinking so much? Why are you clearing your throat?" And I'd be like, "Oh, allergies or something in my eye, whatever." And when they did find out, it would become kind of awkward. And I realized like as I got older and I got more confident in myself and confident, you know, having Tourette syndrome, like it's not gonna, it's not gonna ruin my life or anything. Like it's totally normal. I feel like that's whenever I got a lot more positive responses about having Tourette syndrome. But mm -hmm. I do have to say, I have had a negative response as working in the healthcare field because mm -hmm. right now I'm in graduate school for speech language pathology. And a lot of the times you need to do shadowing. So every time I would shadow, I would start disclosing, oh, by the way, I have Tourette syndrome before they met me. And immediately they would say, you can't shadow here with us. They wouldn't even wanna meet me. They'd be like, you just can't because of the fact that you have Tourette syndrome. We don't think that you'd be a good fit here. And I started to not disclose it until I met them mm -hmm. in professional instances. And I feel like that's been really helpful because if they have any questions about me having Tourette syndrome or like what it is, I can disclose it to them in that moment versus having them have these preconceived emotion, um, notions of what Tourette syndrome is and immediately closing off the line of communication. So I don't know if that would be helpful for people who are thinking about disclosing it in a professional setting, maybe waiting until you meet them. So they can see you as a genuine person and not just another, you know, like mystery figure with Tourette syndrome, which who knows what they think that is, you know? Yeah, they might, again, you know, if people commonly think it's, it's, you know, coprolalia only pretty much. Um, and so, 
you know, that really, you know, occurs in just like one of, you know, one of 10 cases. Um, but yeah, it's just such a prevalent, you know, um, misconception because of the media. So it's, it is likely that perhaps they did think that when you told them and, you know, so yeah, you bring up a great point that, um, you know, allowing them to just see, see you and, you know, um, and understand who you are and, um, you know, can help before revealing. So, um, yeah, and, and have um, any of you ever been, you know, I guess overtly discriminated against due to ticks or other aspects of your identity? You know, it sounds like you got, you know, that may fall into that area, what you described on the job kind of discrimination. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and to like expand on that, in graduate school itself, I've been discriminated against because of wanting to get accommodations which is something honestly new to me because I hadn't had accommodations in undergrad, even though I probably should have. I just, I didn't know when I, I got involved with the Tourette Association near the middle to end of my undergraduate career. So I didn't really have the resources to go and get accommodations. I didn't know that that was something that I was um, eligible for. And now that I do, and I'm so much more educated about it, Mm -hmm. I was thinking about getting accommodations and I got a really negative response from my graduate program and they were saying really that even though it's legal they need to accommodate me they don't really know if they can in my program and I found that really interesting considering that it is a helping profession so you would think that they would be very understanding about helping someone who needs accommodations but um I've received kind of like a negative reaction from them and I'm actually still working on that, um, getting those accommodations fulfilled by my graduate program. So that's something that I'm dealing with right now that I don't know if other people have had similar experiences, you know, having colleges kind of discriminate against or programs discriminated against you for having Tourette syndrome, even when they're not really in a position to. So, yeah. Well, I can I can tell you from from uh, again from the old, older person's perspective, we didn't have any of that. There were no accommodations. There was none of that kind of stuff that happened back when I was in, in college. You know, I just worked with my professors the best I can. Then when I went back and got my my first master's degree, luckily it was in choral conducting, so I was able to move a lot. And most of them, uh, most of the professors worked with me there. And then when I got my administrative degree, master's degree in that. Um, it was mostly online. I've learned that really helps because uh, I'm able to mute and do that kind of stuff. And so I, I'm, I'm a proponent of online schooling because of that for for folks like us. But uh, definitely discriminated against. Uh, you know, back earlier again when it was not as prevalent or not as as well educated as the site, the the community is now. I mean, you know, especially being a a, a gay person uh, in in the heart of Indiana um in the uh, 80s and 90s was not allowed let alone to be weird on top of that so yeah i was a lot of discrimination when i was in college and then even in jobs i mean the question always comes up do you say anything during interviews i'm like nope it's in it's in my resume that i'm a part of the Tourette association boards if they want to ask they can ask but i'm not going to volunteer it so mm -hmm. yeah that is understandable yeah, yeah i dealt with some discrimination at my school um, because my dream job is to be a special needs teacher with preschoolers. And so I wanted to work with the preschoolers. And before I even talked to this teacher, I disclosed I had Tourette's syndrome. And she immediately told me like, no, you can't work with us. You can't do the teacher program because of your Tourette's syndrome. And at the time, I didn't know how to go about like dealing with that. So I kind of just let it go. I was like, I won't do it. You know, it's fine. But also, in the job front, um, when I've told jobs like right off the bat that I have it, I've never gotten a call back. So I've kind of learned that I just close it um, after the interview, like after I've gotten the job or towards the end of the interview, if I feel like it'll work out for me. Because sometimes I've just closed the end of the interview and they've just straight up told me, no, because of it, you're not a good fit. You know, you know, we don't know how to work with someone like you. And that's always, really hard to hear and really hard to deal with, but also just I've dealt with discrimination going out and about into like stores and things like that um, on more bad tick days. Um, I was once followed around in my local Costco, which was really hard to deal with. And 
it was really embarrassing as well because people were kind of just staring as I was trying to like work out the situation, explain to her, hey, I have Tourette syndrome. Yahoo! Uh, I'm not mm-hmm. being loud for no reason. I'm not doing this for attention. I just genuinely have Tourette syndrome. And she was just not receptive and the people in the store weren't very helpful either. They just kind of were like, well, maybe, you know, you should leave or you should try to be quieter. So that was really difficult to deal with as well. And it's just hard when people aren't receptive to the education that you try to give them. Yeah, so it, it's, um, you know, you you may try to explain, but it's not, it doesn't always help in the heat of the moment. You know, people still kind of, you know, don't realize quite the, you know, the involuntary nature of it and, you know, are telling you to stop or to leave. Um, and, and yeah, that, that's challenging. Was this a, sec- a security guard who was following you around or an employee? It was actually just another customer. And then when I went to someone who worked there and kind of said, hey, you know, this is the situation, they kind of pinned it on me as if I stopped and she would kind of leave me alone instead of addressing the fact that I'm doing something involuntary and she's following me around for doing something I can't control, but she can control the fact that she's being ignorant. I see. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that that's awful to have to deal with that, so. Um. I wanted to like say really quick, Chloe, I really resonate with that experience because I've also been in like the grocery store and I've had things where I have to repeat with what other people say. And people have looked at me like I'm the craziest person in the whole world. They're like, they think I'm being rude. And then they, it turns into like confrontation and having to explain, okay, I have Tourette syndrome. Like, I'm not trying to bother you. I can't control this. And um I know it's really tough so yeah I resonate with that me me too actually I um that uh your story made made me think of this was I mean this pretty recently too a few years ago I was like in a restaurant in um San Francisco and like I also have um coprolalia and you know this is kind of where I think we as people were really challenged to you know stay calm and you know not always assume the worst of people, but you know, I, it was tough, you know, they were, it was like, there were like maybe six elderly women and they were all eating. And one of them turned to me because I was just taking and she was like, hey, like, can you move? Like you're really ruining my food. I'm just trying to enjoy like this cup of soup, like on a Sunday and you're really ruining it, blah, 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 blah. And I think for me, I you know it's challenging. It's really hard to not um, get upset. I mean, I definitely got really upset. And, you know, of course, like there was no, there was no way for them to know that it had Tourette's, but just, it, it, it's, it's really tough. And I think it can get frustrating because I think we're put in a very difficult situation because it's either we just take it and it kind of hurts and we feel like we didn't get to stand up for ourselves or we do stand up for ourselves. And I did in that moment. And, you know, I told her what it was. I told her that I can't control this. And I told her that I'm not doing anything wrong because I can't control this. This is who I am. I'm not moving. If you have an issue with it, you can tell the waiter to move you guys to a different table because that's something you can control. I can't control this. She didn't like that very much. But again, I think it puts us in a hard position because we're, I, I think every day we're throw, when situations like this happen, like in the grocery store, like that said, or for Chloe too, it's like we're put in this position of, do we speak up? Do we say something? Do we confront? Or do we just stay silent? But then for me, I always leave that moment feeling like, oh my God, like I should have sent, I should have said something, I should have stood my ground. And it just becomes this tough kind of dilemma that I face, like we all face really like all the time. Yeah, with I mean, with Tourette syndrome, you are, you know, you are forced to kind of wear it on your sleeve in a way, you know, and whereas with, you know, some some other conditions you know, no one would know either way. It's just, you know, whether you choose to to share or not, um, you know, you are kind of forced to to disclose in some instances just to kind of keep the calm or avoid a, you know, a, a confrontation, you know, avoid things escalating. Um, and also, you know, just Yvette, you know, when you were talking about your your grad school program and and not, you know, still working on being able to get accommodations, you, you know, you 
you make me think of just um you know this issue where you know when you're when you're younger and you have Tourette syndrome you know there there are much there's much more in the way of um you know accommodations there's you know an, an order to be followed in terms of you know um like i the iep like the individualized education plan the 504 plan so there are like regulations in place to address that but then when we you know when when individuals with Tourette you know approach adulthood it becomes a little bit different you know both um you know both socially and just in school job it's like it it probably feels like you're a little bit on your own more so you know when when you're younger you have your parents you, you know there may be some school advocates but as an adult it's much more you know independent and advocating for yourself a little bit more too which is hard so yeah emily i i totally agree with that because it is kind of like you're more on your own and that's why i think the Tourette association of america is so great because they do have so many resources you have support groups of people that can help you with accommodations i was thinking about reaching out honestly with people who've had similar experiences and it does make you feel more supported but i mean you do have to learn how to be that's why i think it's so important to get education early on because you do have to learn from an early age to be your own advocate especially when things like what's happened to chloe and michael and brian have happened when people call you out in the middle of a supermarket or a restaurant you need to learn how to say confidently you know i have Tourette syndrome i can't control this and if you have an, an issue with it then you can decide to leave you know you kind of have to be your own superhero <laughs> yeah. it's like you really do need you know you have to kind of be very confident and in, in your you know in yourself and um yeah and you know and how have or yeah how have your intersecting identities um you know so Tourette syndrome along with you know either race or ethnicity or or sexuality how has that you know influenced your experience well i can speak uh as as a, someone in the lgbt community um if if you're not and I don't, i'm not trying to marginalize any anyone but if you're not a certain type of person in in that community especially back in the older days then um you know you're not very well accepted within that community anyway and then add on top of you know this going on as well um it was very hard to be accepted within the lgbt community especially back when i was younger again it's one of those things where you know nowadays we're, it's it's much more accepted and you know i know we have a long way to go but um you know i i in the closet my entire first half of my career there was no way i would have ever thought about coming out and uh you know, then I had this on top of it, which even I thought I felt like pushed me further back into the closet, you know, most of my life, because I mean, let alone people handle this problem. If I threw that at them, I mean, I'm going to be disowned or, you know, taken out by the 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 river and beaten to death. And I don't want that to happen <laughs> because of who I am. So and how how I was made. So it's it's at least in the in the, in the LGBT community has been very difficult to or was very difficult at first to make those connections and still is at times yeah so it's kind of you know dealing with you know acceptance within the lgbtq community but then also you know dealing with um you know i guess both of those and the out and outsiders you know um at the general community and your family as well and just feeling potential you know added stigma so yeah and um and uh, what about you, Chloe? How have you felt like, um, you know, as a as a young uh, black woman and and having Tourette syndrome that that has, um, you know, impacted you uh, in any way or you know? It definitely has. Um, one of the most common things I hear from people when I tell them I have Tourette syndrome is, "I've never met a black person with Tourette syndrome." And sometimes it's followed up with, "Are you sure you have it? Because I've never met someone who looks like you." who has it, so I don't, I didn't know that people like you could get it. And it's been kind of frustrating because I know for a fact there's plenty of black people who have Tourette out there, whether they're diagnosed or not, and they may just not have the confidence to speak about it because they don't see anyone who looks like them talking mm -hmm. about it. And that's what encouraged me to talk about it because I wanna show other black people like, hey, you can have this and it's okay. Um, 
and it can be frustrating to not feel like you're seen even by people within your own community because they don't believe that people who look like us can get it because it's a I've been told it's like a white person thing or like oh you hang around too many white people that's why you have it like people like us don't get things like that and it can be very alienating when you're trying to connect with people within your community and they don't accept you because of something that that they view as weird or different or something that we don't have mm -hmm. yeah so there's just yeah there's still just a, a lack of understanding that it can affect you know all races ethnicities ages just yeah so we still have some some strides to make on that front yeah and what about you Yvette So there's actually, Chloe, something that you said about not being accepted by your own community or being recognized by your own community that I feel like I've experienced something very similar. And even this, this resonates with what you were saying, Brian, about not being accepted by the LGBTQ community when you do belong in it. Um, I felt that way kind of with the Hispanic community and then having um, mental health issues. I've recently been diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder and my whole life I've been um, struggling with anxiety and depression and that's just not something that is talked about in the Hispanic community. It's not something that exists. I mean, if someone's having is struggling with mental health issues it's kind of brushed under the rug like no one really talks about it so i was the first one in my family um extended as well to really be vocal about it and, and be open and let people know you know this is what i'm struggling with and you know i could use some support in abc way mm -hmm. and i just think that that's so important when you're feeling so isolated in your community it, it may be uncomfortable but i feel like you kind of have to step out of your comfort zone and really try your best to educate others about what's going on, what support do you need, et cetera. I think that that, I think that, that really helps because um, there just isn't a lot of knowledge, unfortunately, in, in the Hispanic community about mental illness or about Tourette syndrome and what that brings. Because I think, and people have seen the infographic from Tourette Association of America, it's like an iceberg. So it's like the tip of the iceberg is the ticks. So you have the motor and vocal ticks, but then the bottom of the iceberg is like OCD, anxiety, depression, ADHD. Like there are so many other things that are co-occurring. And I think that's what people really need to understand. It's not just what you see. It's not just the motor and vocal ticks that you see. There's so much more to it that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, we, we have a long way to go in terms of, just in increasing increasing knowledge on what it is and what it isn't as well. So, um, and what has been your experience, Michael? Yeah, I think for me, um, actually, I really resonated with everything um, Yvette was saying, and I think what everyone was saying about not feeling accepted in your own community. I think that is honestly the hardest part because I think it's. To me, it feels ironic, you know, so I'm Filipino American and a lot of my friends growing up um, and in college too, but especially in high school, I was having a hard time a lot with a lot of my peers and they were all in the Asian community. And it's interesting, you know, earlier I had touched on how the lack of understanding, you know, in the Philippines of neurological disorders, mental health, um, disabilities, that kind of does extend to a lot of other like cultures and especially other asian cultures as well and i think there's also culturally like parents don't really you know talk to kids about like emotions in that way and what was very interesting is not only did i was experiencing a lot of misunderstanding like kind of with my family but because a lot of my friends who are asian american were also raised in that environment where neurological disorders didn't exist mental health wasn't a thing disabilities don't exist they also kind of adopted that same um, mindset culturally that my family had. So I think what was really difficult for me in high school is kind of everywhere I went, I was just misunderstood. You know, I go home and I'm kind of dealing with all of this with my family and trying to work it out with them. And then I go to my friends and even to my friends' families' houses, it's the same thing. And it's kind of like, there's no escape. And I remember uh, something I really resonated with what Yvette was saying is like, I really had to learn to be very vocal and, you know, some people didn't like that, um, but 
everyone came around, but sometimes, you know, I had to be very vocal and very upfront about this is what Tourette syndrome is. Like the, you know, if you guys are telling me this is not real and this and that, like, you know, you need to check your facts, do the research, look online. And I did have to have hard conversations with friends and families who are also Asian. And it was kind of like, I was going through this, it was deja vu. It was like, I was going through the same thing with my family, but now all of my friends' families as well. And, you know, a lot of them, they all did come around and, you know, as everybody was exposed to me longer, they understood that. But I think it's really interesting because I think um, my culture of being Filipino really influenced the way I perceived myself. I think because it just seemed like every single time, like something with my tics happened, it was just this whole, like, it was just whole, this whole scene. And I think I really internalized from a young age that I was just always causing problems, even though I couldn't control it. I was causing issues. People didn't understand. People were fighting. People were arguing. So I think for me, like because of the cultural environment I was in, I really internalized myself to always like blame myself for certain things that was happening. And that's something that I am learning to unlearn now. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think culture played a big role in that for me. Yeah. So you you learn to you know self advocate and basically you know be your own you know advocate in that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it, it sounds like, you know, it's still a, it's a lot of unlearning that that's taking place now for you. Um, and in terms of that, you know, that kind of self stigma in a way and, you know, feeling like it's, it's your fault and um, in terms of how other people have reacted. So, um, and, you know, a, a lot of you have already touched, touched on this and, you know, in your your answers already, but um, you know, does anybody have um, any other or additional experiences in terms of you know negative interactions with um, institutional systems? So you know, school, like medical or healthcare professionals, law enforcement, religious institutions, security, kinds of places. So yeah, um, I actually I brought this up, mentioned it earlier. I, we actually had a very negative experience with my neurologist when I was first diagnosed. So I was diagnosed around kindergarten. I had recently been accepted into the gifted program for elementary school, so like entering first grade. And when my parents were telling the neurologist, you know, like, oh, she's accepted into the gifted program, the neurologist was like, oh, the gifted program? She can't be in the gifted program. She has Tourette syndrome. She's not hmm. smart enough to be in the gifted program. And my parents were like, what? Is this the health professional? Like it, it did not seem professional at all. And they had done their own research and they knew that wasn't true. So they were like, okay, you know, this is a little strange. And then on top of that, the neurologist said, you can't go to support groups or meet anybody else with Tourette syndrome because then you're gonna catch all of their tics and it's going to be a very negative experience so basically i hadn't met someone else with Tourette syndrome until i was in college which mm -hmm. was very in, it's insane to think about it now because i see so many youth ambassadors and the amazing stuff they're doing and i wish that i had had those opportunities or resources but my my parents didn't i mean they didn't know so it was the neurologist so i mean they believed they believed him when he had said, you know, don't let her meet other people with Tourette syndrome. Um, mm -hmm. So that was kind of like some misinformation from them. And I think that they maybe needed some education about Tourette syndrome that we couldn't provide at the time because we were still learning. And I was little, so I didn't know anything. <laughs> yeah, that's so yeah, that's a lot of misinformation. Um, and, and yeah, and you know, as the, you know, as the patient going to see the provider, you, you know, you, you will listen to them and, you know, as they are, you know, it's kind of that like they are, you know, ideally supposed to be the expert on it or, you know, at least have some knowledge. But I mean, we do know that's not, you know, that's certainly not always the case. Um, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, especially as a neurologist, you would think. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And um, has anyone else had, um, you know, negative experiences with, with institutional systems? Yeah, I had some some teachers in my high school career who just assumed I was less intelligent 
because of my tics. Like just though they would treat me differently than other classmates because they just assumed I wasn't capable of doing the same things as everyone else because of my tics or they wouldn't let me do certain things because of my tics. Like if we're doing group activities, they would single me out because they felt as if I wouldn't let the group work because of my tics or I had a particular math teacher who would single me out all the time and kind of say, oh, you know, the reason you're not doing well in math is because of your Tourette syndrome, you know? And she claimed that like Tourette syndrome made you worse at math, which I don't know where she got that from because that's not true. But she kind of used that as an excuse for the way she treated me because she's like, oh, it's because of your Tourette syndrome and I don't really have to put an effort into helping you because you're not helpable. Like I can't help you with that. Um, and so that was frustrating and also, um, I haven't been to church in a while, but when I used to go to church, I would get negative reactions from people because people would either think it was possession or that I just wasn't, you know, religious enough and that I didn't put enough work into my religion. And if I did, you know, I wouldn't have this condition. I was being punished in a way or my family was being punished. And so that was really difficult to hear and to deal with. Yeah, you've, you've, a lot, you've had a lot of interactions with these different institutions. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, we still do need to do a lot of education, you know, with, with religious institutions as well, you know, because they can be a, a great, a great resource, you know, if they, if they have the, you know, the information and the education, um, you know, I, it does seem like, you know, for the black community and, and perhaps the Latino community as well, um, you know, kind of religious religious coping um, and, you know, religious kinds of, uh, you know, mental health resources may be preferred um, over, over others for some. And so, you know, it could, it could certainly be a great help um, in spreading awareness. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, sorry, go yeah. ahead. Oh no, but I, yeah, I was just gonna say, but yeah, I'm seeing the, you know, this the issues with, you know, just people, <clears throat> you know, the misconception that Tourette syndrome means that you, you know, you can't learn or, you know, um, yeah, you're different in that way. That seems to be coming up in both of what, you know, Yvette and Chloe have said so far, so. And yeah. for me, I was always the discipline problem in school. I mean, I, I it was, I was told that I can control this, that I shouldn't be making these noises, that you're just doing it to get in trouble and get out of, get, get out of class. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was, when I was young, I, I was in the office more than I was in class, but that was something I just couldn't help. And they didn't understand that. No one understood that. And I, I you were thinking about, you talked about institutions. I, and I know it's a pandemic and everything, but even before that, I cannot remember the last time I was in a movie theater. I was kicked out of so many for a while that I just finally gave up. Um, yes. I, it would be, it would have to be either early 2000s or late 90s, the last time I was in a movie theater, to be honest with you. Wow. I, it's it's just not worth the fight in my mind. Yeah. So it's like you have to, you'd have to change, a, you know, an aspect of your experiences, you know, which, you know, you probably enjoyed um, because of Tourette syndrome. Well, I'm, I'm a firm believer of choose your battles, you know, for for me, that's just not worth a battle for me to fight. First of all, it's always expensive to go to the movie theater anyway. So instead of spending twenty five dollars on a bucket of popcorn, I'll go buy a box of microwave popcorn and enjoy it later. So that's the way I look at it. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's true. And I, none of us have gone for the past year. So that's, <laughs> that's kind of how it is. A lot is coming straight to the streaming platform. So, um, yeah, and, and Michael, what's your experience been like? Yeah, I think um, institutionally, a lot of it recently really was like with college. I know um, it's been talked about earlier with the accommodations. I think testing accommodations, that's something that's been really tough um, to get, I think. So my school is already ahead of a lot of schools in which it does have a disability resource center, um, mm -hmm. which is already good. I, I, I've known of schools that don't even have that yet. Um, but I think what was really tough is we, I've had teachers who, I mean, first of all, there's a lot of extra work that we have to do. And I think you brought it up, Emily, you made a good point where in high school, I think you have like a whole, you know, a lot of staff and like parents to really help with um, getting all of your accommodations, your paperwork, your documentation. In college for me, it was really a lot of it was like, 
I still had help, but it was much more me driving the process. And it's, it's a lot to do, you know, just, yeah. just to shed light on the process to just for every single test that I wanted to take, I wanted to take it like, you know, in a separate room. Cause I find that when I'm taking tests around other people, 50% of my attention is going to worrying about like, oh my God, are they like looking at my ticks? Is my tick gonna impact someone else's test? Like, am I gonna disturb someone else? And honestly, by the time that I'm even looking at my like test, 30 minutes has passed because I'm like so worried about everything else around me. Um, so it's really important to have that special room. But just to get that special room, like our university required me to fill out like several paperwork for every single test to say specifically when I had to get it signed off, you know, all these hoops, I had to get the teachers to send it the test early. And I ran into a lot of problems where teachers didn't want to put in extra work, extra work. They didn't want to send the test somewhere else. They didn't want to have to pick it up or they didn't want to have to make a different version so I could take it like elsewhere. And there were times where I just, even though I legally have the accommodations, I was basically, it's not that I was told not to, but it was so inconvenient to use my accommodations that I ended up not, <laughs> which is just kind of um, um, frustrating at times, I think. And like Brian said, like sometimes it's just a battle that I didn't feel like fighting. Um, it's kind of sad because it's, I, in my opinion, it's a battle that I should be fighting. Um, it is my right to have these accommodations, but sometimes it's like, Honestly, if I'm gonna spend two hours to go to meetings and write letters and emails to fight me taking a test in a specific room, I may as well put that extra time to just studying for the exam. And it kind of is frustrating that the institutions put us in that situation, especially since my institution is already supposed to be like ahead of the curve um, for disability resources. Um, so, you know, definitely that's just one example of colleges that can be very difficult yeah and you and so and you would you would have to kind of make these arrangements for each class it sounds like, like every every quiz class. every class every class you know every teacher has their own you know way of doing it and it's you it, you know it should be the school and the teachers accommodating to us but it mm -hmm. ends up becoming the student accommodating to the teacher and making it easier for the teacher to accommodate us which just if you ask me it doesn't make sense <laughs> Yeah, that sounds exhausting having to deal with that. So, yeah, and um, I think it would be, you know, helpful to, you know, in closing, if uh, each of you could share your biggest challenge surrounding managing Tourette syndrome. So let's see, Who wants to jump in. Yeah. Um, um, oh, go ahead. Or no, don't worry, Brian. You can go. Oh, just for me, it's still just the day to day. You you get worn out, you get tired. Um, you still don't sleep very well. Even after all these years for me, I still have to pull off the road sometimes when I'm driving just to get through ticks. <clears throat> it's just the daily grind. It while it's become a part of my life so much that I've never really known any other thing else or anything else. It's just the hardest challenge for me is just to try to keep as positive as I can. And I work very hard at that by getting myself surrounded by a good system, support system of, of friends. And I have a service dog who you saw in the middle of the video there. I apologize. He was all about wanting to be up in my face that time. But, uh, you know, you, we persevere and we do the best we can. Um, but that's the biggest challenge for me is just the the day to day <coughs> issues of trying to say a sentence sometime and you can't say it, you know. <coughs> So that for me, that would be where it is. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Yvette, go ahead. So Brian, I like how you said that it is difficult to stay positive and that's something that's so important because for me, like I feel like my biggest challenge has been dealing with my mental health alongside Tourette's. So dealing with depression and anxiety and my first suicidal thoughts and having to deal with that with my family, I feel like it's been very, very difficult to see that there's like light at the end of the tunnel. But I think it's so important that people remember that it does get better. Your takes may not get better, but your mindset can get better. And I just think that that is what's super, super important um just changing the way that you perceive and think about 
your tics and its, its experience as part of your life. Mm -hmm. So for you, it seems like the, you know, having uh, an additional condition can be, you know, is it is a challenge um, as well. And, and just, you know, staying positive is, is really important too. Um, and uh, Chloe. I think my biggest challenge has been <laughs> feeling like I can take up space because a lot of the time I worry so much about being an inconvenience to people that I purposely remove myself from situations I want to be in just out of that fear. Like, oh, you know, my tics are really bad. I don't want to inconvenience people at school, so I'll just stay home and do it online. Or, oh, you know, I want to go with my friends and I'm having a bad tic day, so I don't want to embarrass them or upset them. So mm -hmm. I'm just not going to go and learning to be a little more unapologetic about my tics and not letting people's stares scare me or letting what people think, you know, stop me from doing things I want to do. Yeah, so kind of a battling that like kind of social avoidance, it sounds like, and, um, you know, becoming, you know, confident and, and just being present with, you know, socially with your peers and, um, yeah, not feeling, um, you know, I guess inhibited by ticks in that way. Um, and Michael. Yeah, like um, everyone said, and like Brian said, I think the, honestly for me, the hardest part is just that day-to-day -day grind. Honestly, for me, the hardest part, I have to, I've trained myself to give myself credit, honestly, for just getting out of bed and starting the day. Um, something I talk to my friends all the time about is, I mean, with Tourette syndrome and it's, I also struggle with like anxiety and OCD, but what's tough is like from the minute you wake up, it's nonstop, you know, from the tics and then like my thoughts, like it's just nonstop. The moment you wake up, you're having tics and from the moment you get out of bed and you're trying to brush your teeth, do your hair, shower, all these things, all the way until when you're back home trying to go to bed, like your tics are still impacting you going to sleep. And then not to mention trying to like, speak or do your work or anything it's always in the way and i describe it as you know my takes it's like it's always competing for whatever i'm doing like i always say that 50 percent of my energy 60 percent of my energy is already going to my takes and then the rest of it is everything else that i have to do but i still have to do that at 100 percent like everyone else and i think that's what's tough if there are certain days where i can kind of put my ticks to the side and do everything I need to do. And there's certain days where <laughs> the ticks win and the ticks is the only thing I can think about. Um, and I think that's the toughest part is getting yourself out of bed um, and choosing to tackle that day. But like Yvette said, and I really resonated with that, for me, it's a been big mindset thing, like giving myself credit for, hey, Michael, like, good job, you got out of the bed, you chose to take on the challenges of the day. Um, it is like, that's a good thing. And I've been giving myself, learning to give myself praise for like those small things, you know, mm -hmm. being able to just make it through half the day, that's all without like, you know, feeling too down, that's already like a good thing. Just being able to make it through the day is a good thing and wanting to start the next day is a good thing. So giving myself credit for that and really fo working on my mindset um, because we can't really stop the ticks, um, but we, like Yvette said, we can control how we respond to it and how we um, deal with it mentally. Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, it it sounds like it it's you know a battle with your dicks in terms of just you know they kind of consume a lot of your a lot of your focus and attention, um, but you know still you you know you keep a positive mindset, which is great, and you know just rewarding your your efforts as well, which is so important. So, um, well, you know, thank you so much uh, to to all of you for being so candid. Um, and sharing, you know, your your experiences. Um, you know, this has been enlightening, you know, to to hear about, you know, your experiences. And I hope that it has been for our, our audience as well. Um, so now we would uh, like to take um, some audience questions. Um, thank yes, thank you, Emily. And I just want to echo that. Thank you so much uh, to our panelists. Uh, just it's been so informative and and really just wonderful. Here, uh, you share your experiences. 
We have about 10 minutes, so we might be able to take one or two questions. Um, the first question that I have is, uh, can you please ask them if they're open to discuss how Tourette's syndrome affects their romantic relationships? Well, I can tell you for me, I don't have any. So there you go. How about that? That makes it easy for me. I'll let the rest of the young bucks take care of that one. So I actually am engaged right now and I've been with my boyfriend. For, thank you. I've been with my boyfriend for five years and he's watching right now. So he's probably laughing. Um, I think that it doesn't really affect our relationship. I mean, like we, I tick, he knows that I tick. So sometimes we'll be like laying in bed and then I'll start kicking my legs. That's one of my ticks or I'll start like shuddering. That's another one of my tics and he's really used to it now. I think the biggest thing was introducing it when we first started dating. So like I waited like a date in before I said, oh, by the way, I have Tourette syndrome. Um, and at first he actually didn't believe that I had it. And I got kind of offended. I remember I was, I was thinking, oh my God, how could he think I don't, why would I lie about that? Um, but eventually, like after like a day or two he realized oh my god I made a mistake and he apologized and was like I'm really sorry for saying like not believing that you had it you know like I just explain it to me and basically it was just having that open communication and that relationship that I think has made it been so successful and I think that's super important for anybody entering a romantic relationship is to have that open communication about your Tourette syndrome and how it affects you mm -hmm. Yeah, and bouncing um, off of what Yvette said, I think it's interesting. So for me, like I um, just started dating someone. This is the first first relationship I've ever been in. And I think for me, open communication, I think is important, but I think a lot of it just comes down to, um, I think when it's with the right person, like then it becomes easier. I think for me, I just had to be very upfront about, you know, if I'm having a bad day, if these ticks, you know, there's a lot of times I come home from a day from work and it's like, I'm just exhausted. And when I come home, like, I, I don't want to talk. I'm just going to be ticking, 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 and ticking. And it's one of these things where I also think that when you're in a romantic relationship, as opposed to being with friends, they definitely see you at times where most other people like won't see you. They're going to see you at the end of the day or something like that. And I think that for me, that's like when I'm like unwinding with my ticks. And I think being very open and communicating, like, you know, don't take this personally or, you know, just communicating that. But I think for me, I found that it has helped me. I think if you find um, someone that is understanding, for me, it's been really helpful because now I have someone who does understand what I'm going through. It does make you feel less alone. And I think for me, it has actually helped me. Um, but, you know, I've avoided dating for so long because I was so scared of that. I was so scared to open up to someone. I was so scared to disclose that I have Tourette's and was worried about how that might impact anything. Um, so I will say that did a, uh, I was afraid of that for, for such a long time, largely because of um, everything with Tourette's. So for me, I've been in one romantic relationship and she was always really understanding. Like from the minute I told her, she was like, okay, you know, I may like, she didn't really know how to react initially, but she did get used to it after a while. Um, and echoing what Michael said, sometimes I would just come home and I just didn't want to talk to her or talk on the phone. I was just like, I just want to unwind and relax. And she was always really understanding about that. Um, and just finding someone who listens to you and listens to your needs um, is really important. Um, finding someone who is willing to educate themselves and understand your struggle will make the relationship so much smoother. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your experiences. I have another question. Um, someone mentioned they were unfortunately kicked out of their online Tourette support group for coming out as trans. They asked, have any of you experienced discrimination within the Tourette's community? I haven't. Um, 
I know there are some who obviously have an issue with it. Um, there are some I work with here every day that have an issue with the teachers and I have a very, very religious principle, uh, but you know, I am who I am and I'm not going to change who I am to accommodate someone else. I can't change that just like I can't <clears throat> stop ticking. I can't change that part of my life. I, I, I didn't wake up one day like anybody else and say, okay, this is what it's going to be. So um, that's unfortunate you were kicked out. I, I, that, that breaks my heart actually. So, um, but yeah, I, I've actually experienced a lot of more embrace, I think, from the Trek community because we all know what it's like to be different in this world. So I I haven't personally faced discrimination within the community, but I have I've had people even with Tourette be a little surprised to see someone who looks like me with it, um, which has been a little interesting. But it's never been discrimination of any sort. It's just been surprise. But I do think it's really sad to face discrimination within your own community um, because you would think those are the people who would understand and would be sympathetic. Um, so I really, my heart does go out to you because I think that is a really awful situation and I hope you can find another support group that will accept you for who you are. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one last question, but um, I know there are numerous questions that we were not able to respond to. I just want to let everyone know that we will be following up after the session with the response. Additionally, here at the Tourette Association, we have a full-time information and referral staff available to assist you by emailing support at Tourette.org or calling 1-88-4-Tourette. Okay, so for our last question, um, this is for everyone. How do each of you think the Tourette Association can better reach people in more diverse communities um, to just educate and spread awareness? I think um, when I think about that question, the first thing that comes to mind is getting more people from minority backgrounds involved. Because if you have every single person that's participating from the same background you're not going to reach those minority backgrounds i really need the extra education because there's not enough resources so i feel like by employing more people from diverse backgrounds by having more volunteers selected from diverse backgrounds and additionally having people reach out to different communities i feel like that's how you're going to get the most bang for your buck i agree and i also think um, that when, you know, the TAA is thinking about like different programming, like when they're making decisions about what programming to make or um, anything like that, I think that the people that should be coming up with those ideas are the people from um, these like diverse communities. Um, I think instead of, you know, the TAA trying to create programming for these communities, it should be reaching out to someone in that community and saying, hey, what should we do? Hey, can do you want to lead and start something? Um, because I think that is going to be then um, it's going to create an event, create a program, create something that is going to be addressing a need from someone who is going through that, someone who feels that need and experiences that need and wants to fill that rather than someone coming, I guess, from the outside and trying to fill that need. Um, I think really like that to go to the people directly and have them uh, come up with the ideas. I definitely agree with a vet on getting people from minorities um, because I feel like if someone sees someone who looks like them, they're more likely to, you know, trust them and build a relationship with them because it's like, oh, you know, my struggle, you know what I go through um, because you're from the same group. Um, and I also agree with Michael on getting people from those minorities to make those programs because you come from a place of understanding how, what type of outreach will work best for these groups. Um, so I think those are both really good ideas. I can't improve on that. I'm just going to let that rest. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I really want to thank again um, to all of our wonderful panelists. Um, thank you so much for your vulnerability and your willingness to share your experiences 
Um, thank you as well to Dr. Ricketts for moderating. Um, I think that I can speak for myself, but I'm sure there are many people echoing that this was just really informative. Um, so for everyone, this is all the time that we have for this session. Once the session is closed, you will receive a survey on the presentation. We would greatly appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with the link to view a recording of the webinar. Additionally, the webinar will be posted on the TAA's YouTube channel for those who are unable to participate today. We encourage you to reach out to us about this webinar or for other resources and opportunities to connect. On behalf of the Tourette Association, thank you so much again for joining us and taking the time to view our presentation. This presentation was presented free of charge thanks to our generous donors. If you appreciated this session, we welcome you to support the organization. Visit us at Tourette.org to learn more and to give. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, thank you.